Well, it's an amazing thing to realize that the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God who made the beauty that we see in creation, he wants to be in relationship with us. He longs for that. And there is one way to God the Father, that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus was clear about that. The Bible is clear about that. There's one way to come to God through faith in Jesus. He's offered his grace to everyone, but we need to receive it. But once we know Jesus, once we have faith in him, there's many ways to grow in him. One way to know God through Jesus, many ways to grow, many pathways of growth. And that's what we're talking about. Three weeks or two weeks ago, we talked about some pathways that some people walk to get closer to God. We talked about the pathway of wonder naturalists who say, let me be outside. I encounter God and the beauty of his creation. I don't worship creation. I worship the creator. But boy, when I'm outside, it draws me closer to him. Sensates say, let me experience. They, they experience God with their, with their senses, the smells, the sounds, the sights, the touch. And, and they encounter God that way. Great. Meet God that way. Grow in him in that way. There's also traditionalists. They say, I meet God through rhythm and ritual and remembering. Those experiences like communion and certain things that kind of take me back to God's goodness and presence. And so meet God that way. Grow in him because he wants to know you more. He wants you to know him more. And then we talked about the pathways of contemplation. And first is the intellectual pathway. Some people say, I meet God when I learn something new, when I understand something. I say, oh, that's who God is. Man, I worship him more. So some meet God and counter him with their mind, and that moves to their heart and their lives. There's a pathway of the ascetic. And the ascetic says, let me be alone. Let me have quiet and solitude and simplicity. And some people say, I don't meet God in the, in the loudness of life. I meet God in the very quiet places. Then meet God in those places. Encounter him more. Walk with him more closely. And some people have the pathway of the contemplative. And they say, let me feel. They, they emotionally connect with God. They feel his love. They feel his presence. They, 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 they just, I'm so in love with Jesus. And that's how they're wired. Then pursue God that way. Come to know him through Jesus Christ, but grow through these different pathways. But there's a whole other group we haven't talked about yet. And some of you are saying, when's it my turn? <laughs> now, hopefully it's today. Uh, it's the engaging in the pathways of action. There are some people who they meet God while they're doing, while they're going, while they're moving, while they're engaged in doing something. They meet God in the action of life. And that draws them closer to the Father. Some people were created for action and God delights in this. If you're that kind of a person, God looks and says, I made you that way. I love that part of you. And so let's think together about the three pathways of action. People that meet God and encounter God through their actions. Here's the first one. The pathway of the caregiver. The pathway of the caregiver. The caregiver says, let me care. Let me serve. Let me come alongside of somebody. Here's a little description for you. Caregivers encounter the presence of Jesus in the faces and needs of the people around them. They are moved to love God and live for him as they come alongside of the needy, the broken, the hurting, or the spiritually searching and help meet whatever needs they have. Caregivers encounter God Almighty as they're engaged with people who are in points of need and they can help meet those needs in the name of Jesus Christ. And so there's all kinds of examples of caregivers in the Bible and through history and our world today. Here's an example of a caregiver from the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn to Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. We're going to look at a guy named Mordecai. If you know the story of Esther, you know the name Mordecai. You might go, I never heard of that guy. Now you get to hear about him. So I'm going to read these words from Esther chapter 2. I'll read verse 7 and 10 through 11, and we'll look at this just briefly at this character, Mordecai. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. She'd been orphaned. This is care. He takes in somebody and cares for her. Esther had not revealed her nationality. She came from a Jewish background and her family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now there's a whole story behind this that we're not going to get into today. But I want you to notice three things about Mordecai. Three signs that he was a caregiver and the way he interacted with God and with people. First, he saw somebody in need. Somebody who'd been orphaned, lost her parents. And he said, I'm taking her in. 
That's an extension of the heart of God and care. Second, he gave her wisdom and direction. It's funny, some people read the Bible and they read it completely wrong. Some people might read this and say, you know, she had not revealed her nationality or family background because Mordecai had forgiven her to do so. Oh, this is just a man telling a young woman what to do. He's domineering. No, he's protecting her life. It's like the parent who says to a kid, don't ride your bike out in a busy street. I forbid you to do it. They do it because they want to dominate their kid and they hate their child, right? No, they do it to save the kid's life. There's times where you put down rules because you know you can see what they can't see. So he's looking out for her. He's protecting her. And then every day, he's kind of walking near where she is to make sure she's okay. You can see all that plays out in the story if you want to read the book of Esther. But here's a person who just cared deeply and lived that out. Jesus modeled this. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, that's where Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I had no clothing, you clothed me. When I was in jail, you came and visited me. And people said, Jesus, when, when did we do that? You know what Jesus said? As you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. She said, as you care for the hungry, the broken, Jesus, you're doing it for me. And caregivers feel that. When they're helping someone in need, they know they're glorifying God and helping Jesus. As you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. So Jesus himself modeled this and now he cared for all kinds of people who were broken and sick and hurting. He modeled that. And then a modern day example. As I thought about this, this pathway, I thought of somebody named Debbie Rose. And almost no, none of you know who Debbie Rose is. She was my assistant for 13 years when I pastored a church in West Michigan. She was also our worship leader and my assistant. Those are two tough jobs. And so, but she did a great job. But, but, but Debbie not only led worship and not only was my assistant, she was a caregiver. She met Jesus by caring for others. So almost every shut-in in our church, in that church, every elderly person who couldn't get out of their home, Debbie would go and care for them and visit them. She'd write them cards, give them words of encouragement. She even, it was funny, she would do canning. I'd never heard of canning before. And the funny thing about canning is you don't put anything in a can, you put it in a jar, but that's another topic. Um, but she was, she was big into canning, so she would jar all these things, you know, uh, vegetables and fruits and different things, and, she, and then she'd bring them over to people who were shut in to care for them. She cared for their souls, she cared for their emotions, she cared for their bodies, and she met Jesus doing it. That's a caregiver. Some of you are going, that's me. I meet Jesus in caring for people in need. Wonderful, praise God. So how do you walk with God on this pathway? Here's some ideas, ways you can walk down this pathway. There's more in Gary's book that you can look at, but here's some things. Caring for a forgotten group of people, like the homeless, often forgotten. Coming alongside and helping where you can. Caring, we have some ministries here at Shoreline where we care for people who are marginalized like that. Helping a friend through a hard time. Some of you have that caring gift and you walk with a friend who's struggling and going, and you're kind of the one that comes alongside and cares for them and shines God's love into their situation. Uh, foster care ministry, an incredible way, a challenging way to care. Pour yourself into the lives of others. Walking with people through substance addiction, doing counseling and care for people dealing with substance addiction. Uh, counseling at a pregnancy care center is a way to show the care of Jesus. Serving in a soup kitchen. Coming and helping at the Shoreline Food Pantry, clothing closet, a lot of things that happen on our campus. We have a ministry here at Shoreline where we help people in their homes who can't afford to and don't have the ability to fix things, and we have a fix-it team that goes in and cares for people by fixing things. That's a way to extend the love of Jesus and to meet him as you serve others. Some people are great with technology. I know young people that help older people learn how to use their technology, use their computers, and that's a way that they can use their gifts and care for others. Uh, Sherry and I have a dear friend who's on the board of World Mission with us, uh, and uh, she has got a financial background. She helps people who are struggling financially plan their first budget and learn how to live on a budget. Caring. There's lots of, you get the point, lots of ways to do it, but people that are wired like this who meet Jesus by caring, find your place and get engaged and meet Jesus and see the face of Jesus in the eyes of those you serve and care for and walk alongside of. Now, with all of the different pathways, there's ways we can kind of wander off the path. There are little pitfalls or potholes, things we got to watch out for. So if you're a caregiver, if that's the way God has made you and you're engaging in that, here's three pitfalls to watch out for. The first one, beware of becoming judgmental of others. You just don't care like I do. You can feel like that because here's the reality. Some people don't care like you do. You're wired for this. You're designed for this. You meet God in this. And you might look at somebody who says, well, they're a contemplative and they want to go somewhere very quiet and reflect. It's like, come on, get up and do something for Jesus. Come along with me and care for people. It's like, well, they're meeting Jesus. 
They're meeting Jesus in the way that God has made them. Now, let me be clear. Every Christian is called to be compassionate. Every Christian is called to be generous. There's no excuses to not be, you know, we all do that to some measure. But some people, the caregiver, just does it like on steroids. I mean, they are like super caring. Don't expect everyone to be like you at that level. Does that make sense? That's a pitfall. Watch out that your spirit doesn't become judgmental. Here's another pitfall to watch out for. Be careful that in your serving others, you don't end up just serving yourself. If your only thing is, it makes me feel good to serve, so I'm going to do it, and it begins feeding yourself, and it's just for me, in the process, you forget the people you're actually serving, and you can forget the God that you're serving through this action. And the pathways are meant to bring us closer to God. So while you're serving, make sure your heart isn't just on, I love doing this, but also, I love these people, and I love the Lord, and that all connects together. And then here's another one, and I saw this when I was a college student, when I went away to school, uh, to a Christian college. Um, You can end up caring for those far away, and forgetting to care for those who are right next to you. I'll give you an example. When I went away to school, I went to a Christian school called Wheaton, and I had never met so many pastor's kids and missionary's kids in my life. I grew up in a non-believing home. I didn't know pastor's kids or missionary's kids. Probably half the students at the college, it seemed, came out of a pastor's home or a missionary's home. And here's a story I heard again and again. I talked to students who said, I don't really like the church, and I'm not sure if I like Jesus, and I'm angry at my parents. Missionaries and pastors. Why? He said, because they had so much time and energy to care for everyone in our community, in our church, or where we were. And they would get home and they had nothing left to give to us kids. And they were, when the phone would ring or something would happen, they would go. But we got missed. If you have this, this pathway, make sure that you care and do it and glorify God and walk with Jesus and you're caring. But make sure you keep enough energy that when you get home to your own family, to those closest to you, you have the energy to care for them. Does that make sense? So if you're a caregiver, you know, keep an eye on those pitfalls. But just because there are pitfalls doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue that. It just means we have to do it with wisdom and keep these things in mind. Okay, here's the second pathway we're going to talk about today, the pathway of the activist. And let me say, words change meaning. Some people hear activist today and all they think is politics. That's not what this is talking about. Gary wrote this book 25 years ago and began looking at these things. So, so, so the, the activist says this, let me conquer For the glory of God in this broken world, let me do something that conquers evil and injustice and stands for Jesus. Sometimes that does overlap in the political arena, but this is not a political concept. It's a spiritual concept. Some people feel like, I've got to take action that will conquer evil and bring God's presence into our world. And so there are people who just, they have that passion to overcome that which is wrong and make a difference for the Lord. So let's learn from some people on the path of the activist. Here's one from the Old Testament, Elijah. We're going to be studying this passage in Elijah a couple weeks from now. I'm going to give you just a little little preview, a little sample here. But Elijah was somebody who took action. And so in in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 25, we read these words. And it's within a certain setting where where there's these false prophets who are misleading God's people. And uh, they're leading people down to, to worship idols and to turn their heart from God. And Elijah is alone battling all of these prophets saying, this is wrong, this is unjust, and God needs to win your hearts back again. So this is this spiritual battle going on. 1 Kings 18, 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, these false, Baal was a false fertility god. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God and do not light the fire. So when they took the bull he had given them, they prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal, this this false idol, from morning until noon. Baal, answer us. They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar they made, that they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and you need to wake him up. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until the blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. These false prophets were misleading people away from the one God who could save them, Yahweh. And Elijah says, no way. We're going to lift up God. And this this, this spiritual battle ensues. We'll look at that two weeks from now when we start the series on Elijah and Elisha. But you can see within him just this willingness to stand up and fight for the glory of God in this broken world. Moses, if you read Moses' life, Moses sometimes would would take action that was too much action and he got in trouble from God for doing wrong things sometimes. He'd be like, when he'd see something that was wrong, he'd be like, I'm dealing with it. 
That's, well, you got to keep, that, and we'll talk about pitfalls in a minute. When you're an action person, you can go on your own power or lead, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. But through Moses' life, you see that action. And then there's somebody, Robert Pierce. Some of you know that name. But Robert Pierce had this one line that guided his life. And he challenged other people to hear these words. Here was his quote. Robert Pierce said this, Let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Isn't that powerful? Let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. And then Robert Pierce would have said, and then do something about it. Take action. This man started, he started World Vision, one of the first international ministries that would bring food and clothing and education and spiritual teaching about Jesus to children all around the world. Millions and millions of children have been impacted by that ministry. One person started that. In 1950, he started that. In 1970, he started another ministry called Samaritan's Purse. We partner with Samaritan's Purse in some of our outreach ministries. And that has impacted millions and millions and millions of children. Now think about this. One guy who let his heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God and took action has mobilized millions of people to make a difference. Activists change the world. And your circle that you might change could be one or two people you're helping, some folks you serve food to here. It might be five people, 20 people, 100 people. It could end up being millions of people. But activists say, I see what's wrong. I see what needs to be done. And I meet God as we stand together and fight for what is right. Now, for some of you, go, that's, that's me. I was thinking about that and thinking about just kind of modern day people. And this is the person who came to my mind. It's someone who's part of Shoreline Church, Veronica Alexander. Some of you know Veronica, some of you don't. She's actually married to Rick Alexander, Dr. Rick Alexander, who's the vice president of our church board. When I came to Shoreline and when I met them, I found out right away about Freedom Fields. Veronica was part of this program that was going to parts of the world where there were landmines that had been put in because of civil wars, and children would go out to play and literally be killed or disfigured because of a landmine. She said, that's wrong. That's something. And so she got involved, and she was at that time part of helping remove landmines in different parts of the world. And... She was the president of the board as a volunteer of Trinity Christian High School because she said, we need to have a strong Christian high school right here in Monterey. So she poured time into that as a volunteer. And she was volunteering at Shoreline with the outreach ministries. That's an activist. <laughs> Internationally, you know, locally, personally. Let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God and then do something about it. So let's walk with God on this pathway. Let's think about it. How do, how do you walk with God on this pathway? If you're at home, you're going to see a picture there of actually, this is a baptism happening in a prison. And people have gone into that prison, shared Jesus, and this is amazing baptism. So it's just a picture of somebody coming out of the water, being baptized, they're incarcerated. An activist will say, I, I want to go and help where there's a need and nobody else wants to go. And jail ministry is one of those places. We have a jail ministry here for women, which again, we can't go in right now, but we're like at Disneyland, waiting at the gate. When it's open, our team's back in there again. And some new people get involved in that ministry. But that's a place. You know, go to the people that are oftentimes forgotten. How do you become an activist for Jesus and live for him? One way that people have done it is through writing. If you're a gifted writer, you can write things that will, that will touch the conscience and move the heart of people. Charles Dickens wrote on behalf of the orphaned. And many people were moved to help orphans because he wrote about that and how God cared about those people that were forgotten. C.S. Lewis wrote books for children to learn about Jesus and theology in a time during a world war where there was so much conflict in the world. And he tried to bring the message of Jesus through writing. Some people can speak to people's hearts and move them to action through writing. You can stand alongside the voiceless. There are some in our world who are voiceless, the unborn, the marginalized, the forgotten. Who are the ones that can't speak for themselves? Activists speak for them and stand for them. You can serve in one of Shoreline's many ministries that help people that are on the margins that are struggling. Activists speak the truth and they're spiritual risk takers. They count the cost and they stand for Jesus even when it's challenging. For some of you, you have deep concern about where a lot of our public schools are going. Some people say, I'm concerned. Activists say, I want to do something. They may start prayer walking around the different schools in our community. They might, they might start saying, how do we help schools succeed but also teach things that aren't going to harm children but that will help children? I mean, an activist says, not, not I'm bothered. Anyone can say I'm bothered. Activists say, what can I do? Oh, Lord, what can I do in partnership with you to bring victory in this area? And they move into action. Activists can serve in lots of ways. Prison ministries, creation care. Activists can look and say, man, when the world's getting messed up, 
I want to step in and make a difference. You know, do you know of all people, you know of all people who should be the most concerned about caring for what God has made and created? It should be Christians. Why? We know the creator. We know the artist personally. And we know what he's made. And so you can say, I want to make a difference and I want to help. The, the, one of the first commandments in the Bible, in all the Bible, God's created the heavens and the earth. He makes people and he puts them in the garden and he says, tend and care for the earth. Tend and care for this garden. One of the first things God commanded was take care of what he's made. Christians should be, take action and make a difference. We need people who meet Jesus while they impact the world for his glory. Some pitfalls and potholes for action. So if you're going, man, that's me, that's me, that's me. Don't, cut, don't stop yet. Listen for me. Here's some pitfalls and potholes for you to watch out for. The first one, same as the previous one, caregiver, judgmentalism. Be careful you don't become judgmental if other people aren't as active as you are. If that makes your heart sore, connects you with God, that's great. Again, we're all supposed to take action and help the Lord and, and His work in the world, but some people do it at a different level. Don't judge others who don't have the same kind of connection you do with those things and as you walk with God. And then uh, be careful, watch out for resentment. What does resentment look like? It looks like this. Nobody else cares. I do everything. And you start to resent people for not having the same action and engagement as you do. You can invite people in. You can find other people who have a passion for that. But don't become resentful of others because they don't function exactly like you do. Also, another pitfall for activists is they can lean towards activity over intimacy. Activity over intimacy. What do I mean by that? They can do all these actions that they think will help the world, but they forget to be intimate with God. And all of a sudden, it becomes, it becomes a, a doing action, but no connection to the God who loves people. And a biblical Christian activist is taking action in the name of God for the glory of God because they walk close with Jesus. So don't let the action take over and forget to connect with the one who is ultimately the one who makes things right in our broken world. And, and then one more pathway we're going to look at today. And then next week we're going to come back and look at how all nine pathways, how do we learn to walk on these pathways, discover new ways we can grow and really grow more intimate with God and it can be for all of us. But the final pathway we're going to look at is this, the pathway of the enthusiast. The enthusiast. The enthusiast says, let me celebrate. These are believers who love to connect with God through passionate worship, energetic praise, holy excitement. They hunger to experience the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in gathered worship and just throughout their days. You know, enthusiasts are just like, I want to celebrate God's glory. I want to lift him up. And when they do, they meet with him. They draw closer to Jesus. Remember all of the different nine pathways. One way to God through Jesus, but lots of ways to grow. All of them are meant to bring us more intimately in love with God and connect us to the God who made us and who cares about us. So the enthusiast says, I meet God through celebration. So let's learn from some people who walk this pathway and have walked the path ahead of us. David, King David in the Old Testament um, lots of examples of him being an enthusiast. He was a songwriter. He was a passionate worshiper. But this is probably one of the biggest one of those moments where you see it come out in David. 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, what's happened is the Ark of the Covenant has been taken to the home of somebody and left there, and there's blessing happening in that home. So David says it's time to move the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of David, back to you know, bring it to Jerusalem. So they're moving it there, and along the way, he's celebrating. He is an enthusiast, and so you'll see that in the passage. 2 Samuel 6, beginning of verse 12. Now, King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Out in public, dancing before the Lord with all his might. Some of you are going, I'm not so much of an enthusiast. That's probably not me. Some of you are going, that could be me, right? But he's dancing with all his might while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. This is a celebration. It's like a moving party. Now watch verse 16. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, who was David's wife, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. How could he act like that in public? She was clearly not an enthusiast. <laughs> the enthusiast would be going, that's worship, come on, a little bit more of that, right? But she didn't respond that way. 
We have to be careful when somebody else is meeting with God, we don't say, that's not right. We have to be careful. We don't have to say, your way to meet with God has to be exactly like mine. What we have to do is learn how we can encounter God and experience him. David had that kind of a spirit. I was thinking about a modern person, and the person that came to my mind was Adam Barr. Adam Barr has preached here a number of times, and some of you might remember him, but he's preached at Shoreline before, and he's done work with Organic Arts International. And Adam came as an intern to the church I pastored in Michigan, just passionate, loved the Lord, and he, uh, there was all these college kids that started coming to our Sunday eat. We were doing a five-year walk through the Bible, and all these college kids started showing up and being part of that, so he got all them engaged in meeting once a week to worship together. And they would gather and sing songs of praise and pray and celebrate God for like an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Singing and praising and praying and celebrating God's goodness. And Adam led this. He, th- that's Adam's heart. He's, he's that, and he just loves to meet God and worship and celebrating God's goodness. And in that process, then God empowers you to go out and impact the world. And so there's people like this today that that's their passion. So how do we walk with God on this pathway? What does it look like to, to be people who celebrate God's goodness and bring him glory and lift up his name and meet him as we praise him? So different things you can do. Uh, plan a celebration that includes Jesus. We oftentimes we have birthday parties and anniversary things and we do all kinds of different things and sometimes we forget to invite Jesus. What if you're doing a celebration about something but you said, but I want to bring worship into it. I want to bring praise and prayer and bring glory to God. If you have other people that have a passion for worship, they'll, they'll, they'll get excited about that. But it's, it's a way to kind of bring worship into life's experiences. Bring passion, bring passion with you when you gather with God's people to worship. You can, you can worship with passion and excitement when you're alone, but when you're with God's people, these kind of people sort of, sort of bring an energy and a passion. That's, we, we all love the Lord. We're all worshiping, but some people have the, this, this deeper level of passion. Bring that and express it. But what I always say here is this. When you're worshiping, remember that you're not alone. When you're worshiping, when you're in corporate gathering like this, if somebody says, well, if somebody said, well, you know, when Kevin's preaching, I'm so excited about what he's preaching. I feel so close to Jesus. I want to run up and down this aisle all the way from back and just yell, glory to God, the whole, through the whole sermon. Running back, glory to God, glory to God. And you go, well, that might be distracting for some people, right? But an enthusiast might say, well, I'd like to do that. Here's the thing. If your expression of worship keeps everybody else from worshiping, then you use that expression of worship when you're home alone, but not when you're here in church. Now, there's churches where you could run around and yell glory to God through the whole service and no one's going to even notice because lots of people are doing that. Fine. But you have to look and say, well, where am I? I want to be expressive in worship, but not expressive in a way that actually keeps other people from worshiping. We have to remember that we're not alone when we're in a gathered time like this. But I would say this, if you're an enthusiast, you're going to be more expressive. You're going to be, and that's okay. And don't look at that person and say, oh, you know, they're, they're trying to show off. No, they're just worshiping Jesus. And we have to embrace uh, each person where they are. How do you grow in this pathway? Gather some like-minded people and spend time praying and worshiping, asking God for revival, praying for God to work and to move in fresh new ways in this church, in this world. Enthusiasts need other enthusiasts that they can worship with who go, who go I get it. Here, here's what enthusiasts do at the end of a worship service. They're like, why, why are we stopping? Let's keep going. You know, we do a night of worship where we've sung six or seven... We might have sung six or seven great worship songs, and they're like, let's sing 30 more. <laughs> let's keep going. We're just, I'm just getting warmed up here. Why are we stopping? Sunday mornings we stop because we've got another service. We've got, we've got a lot of details going on. But enthusiasts go, I could just keep on worshiping. That's great. Maybe what we want to do is after a service, meet with five or six or seven other enthusiasts and spend some time praying together and stay in that spirit of worship. Wonderful. Keep nurturing that. Keep connecting with God through that. Gather for prayer. Seek God's face. Enthusiasts need to, to encourage that part of who they are and connect with God that way and invite others to do the same. And then there's some pitfalls here as well. Here's a couple of pitfalls. You have to be careful of experience for the sake of experience. Experience for the sake of... You know, I want to have another... I just want another mountaintop, another experience. And I feel close to God, so I'm just going to keep creating experiences so I can feel a, kind of a spiritual buzz. That's not why God is moving. It's for His glory... And so if it's all about, I, I just need the next, like, it's almost like a drug addict, I need the next fix. Don't let that be the driving thing. It's, I want to glorify God. I want to lift up Jesus. I want to be in God's presence. Keep your focus on that, not on the experience. And then independence over, in, independence over interdependence. Sometimes people that are enthusiasts 
We had to start to separate from the church and from other people and say, I just want to be independent, do my own thing because I know how I want to worship and I want it to be my, the experience that I like. And God calls us to be connected. We're a body. I mean, the, the biblical image of, of the church in, in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 is a united body with all the parts connected. So if you're an enthusiast, but you find yourself becoming more and more independent of other Christians, say, no, we're meant to be interdependent. I need to stay connected. And then one last kind of pitfall and one last little warning for enthusiasts, and that is be careful of confusing good feelings with good worship. So oh, that was a great worship service. I cried. That was a great worship service. I got super emotional. Well, you can get emotional and be on the wrong track. Don't assume that just because something is emotional, don't assume that just because something makes you emotional, it's necessarily glorifying God. Now, sometimes while you're glorifying God, it's deeply emotional. But just because it gives you an emotional high doesn't mean it's really glorifying to God. Now, here's the reality. God's given all these, these nine different pathways. And I think if you ask Gary Thomas, are there probably other pathways? I think he'd say yes. It's not like this is the only nine. It's just that these are ones that are clearly, we see examples in the Bible of people meeting with God these different ways. But the idea is that every one of us can encounter God more, love him more, and find ways to connect with them. And next week, we're going to dig into what does that look like, whatever our pathway is. How, can that kind of, how, how do we leverage that, bless that, bless others, and all of us together fall more in love with God? When Jesus was asked what's the most important thing in all the world, he said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. That's what we're seeking to do. So Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. As we think this week about these nine pathways, as we come together next Sunday and talk about in each of the pathways and all of them together, how do we encounter you, love you more, worship you, celebrate you? Lord, grow our hearts. Give us a vision of you. And help us find ways that we can grow to love you more and live for you and walk with you. And Lord, we want to pause right now and pray, thanking you for those people that have these pathways of action, for the caregivers, for the activists. And, and, and Lord, for, for, for those people who are so enthusiastic, the enthusiasts who are passionate to worship you, we thank you for them and the energy and the action that comes in the world and the church because of them. Bless each one of us in the way you've made us. Help us worship you more and live fully for you. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Before I give you a word of blessing and send you off, I want to give you a couple quick invitations. One is, we got some copies of uh, this book, Sacred Pathways. It's kind of what we've been looking at this, this series. And Gary Thomas, who's preached here, I think every year for the last three or four years, and is excited to come back anytime we can get him back here again. He loves to come to Shoreline. Uh, but we have copies of this book back at the Connection Center if you want to get one and on, on, online. We have a link that you can click on and buy this book if you want to or download it or get an audio book, whatever you want. And we encourage you to dig into this and keep growing and learning as you walk with Jesus. And then also, if you need prayer, if you are here on, in the courtyard or in your car and you need and want prayer, please take time to go right up the stairs here under the big sign that says, Need Prayer. And our prayer team is ready to pray for you. If you're online, you're going to see a phone number you can call and we've got people waiting to pray with you voice to voice right now. You can call and pray or there's an email you can send your prayer and our prayer team will begin praying for you. And then if you are new at Shoreline, we're so glad you're here with us online or in the courtyard. If you're on campus, you can go right back to the connection booth where the big balloons are and just tell them you're new and they want to give you a gift and thank you for coming and give you a warm personal welcome. And if you're online, we want to welcome you also. And so if you will just text the word welcome to the phone number you see on your screen, we will respond to you and do all we can to connect you to the life of Shoreline Church. As we close, I want to give you a word of blessing. And I invite you just to kind of open your heart to receive these words as we close our time together. As you go from here, as you leave the parking lot, as you leave our online experience, as you leave the courtyard. May you walk the one and only path that leads you to God Almighty. Faith in Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And when you know him, may you find unique and distinct pathways that will grow your faith. Don't be content to stay the same. Love him more. Follow him with greater passion. Live more for Jesus. And may you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll be back here again next Sunday morning.